Hello, everyone, and welcome to our COVID-19 series at the Institute for Global Health Sciences. Today, we have an important topic to discuss. This is about testing and uh, returning to work. Uh, this uh, session will be led by Professor Jim Kahn, who's a medical doctor and also an economist who has been at UCSF for a long time, um, retired and now uh, coming back to work with us. So he has led uh, two wonderful Master of Sciences students, Kunta Stara and Sigal Maya. And uh, Professor Ken will be describing a little bit more about their research work. So welcome again. And Professor Kahn, you have the floor. Thank you, Jaime, and, and thank you for inviting us to present our work to this webinar. We're looking forward to sharing the, the presentations and hearing the excellent questions, which I know will follow. Uh, this work started um, a couple of months ago when a colleague of mine who was a a UCSF medical student when I worked with him and subsequently went on and trained in emergency medicine uh, and, and is now practicing at uh, San Joaquin General, he came to me and Jim and he said, Jim, we're making decisions all the time on how to manage COVID clinically and how to reduce risk and all sorts of questions and we're shooting in the dark. We have no idea what to do, which strategies will be most effective which strategies are cost effective or not, we could really use some decision analytic support. So um, we quickly assembled a team to start to look at these questions and did some actually rather rapid analyses in order to try to help uh, the people there in, at San Joaquin um, uh, come up with some you know, reasonable evidence-based decisions. And we uh, took two of those analyses and develop them into more fully formed cost effectiveness analyses. These are uh, looking at the testing of healthcare workers and the testing of workers in a, a general company. And they are related but, but different uh, and um, both draw on what we know these days so far about how the, uh, the uh, infection spreads how it manifests clinically, how the infectiousness relates to clinical status and all sorts of other issues. Uh, we hope that you enjoy our use of uh, cost effectiveness techniques to look at these questions. And without further ado, I will turn the uh, floor over to Sigal Maya, who will start us off. Hi everyone, thank you Jim for the introduction. Okay, so let's dive right in and not wait, leave some time for discussion. Um, so next slide, please. Next. So I want to first talk about why we specifically wanted to focus on healthcare workers and screening them. And this was because they are at more frequent and higher risk contact with COVID-19 patients. So we thought that they may be a vulnerable population in this context. And the ER director we were working with, like Jim mentioned, they had pressing questions about how to use the available testing resources to screen their staff. And so we, our initial theory was that if we strategically assign these immune healthcare workers to care for COVID-19 patients, then we would be able to reduce transmission in the healthcare setting and then avoid the subsequent transmissions that may have occurred in their communities. So at the time we did this analysis, PCR tests were available, but there were many shortages across the states. And then IgG immunoassays were gaining popularity. So we wanted to see if we should be preferring one over the other or what combination of these tests would be the most optimal use of these resources. Just to briefly go over them, the real-time polymerase chain reaction tests or the PCR tests, they look for specific sections of the viral RNA um, but they don't distinguish between active transmissible virus 
versus viral fragments left behind as the infection clears out. So an infect infected individual may be PCR positive for over a month, while there's evidence that no viral cultures can be grown after approximately eight to 11 days post-symptom onset, meaning you're not infectious after that point. And then the IgG assays look for antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. And while this is very useful information for epidemiologic studies or seroprevalence studies, it's not yet clear if these antibodies confer immunity. Um, so if they can be used for policy decisions. So we wanted to look for the most effective way to put these resources to use. So what we did is we built a decision tree based cost effectiveness analysis and we compared no testing, administering only a PCR test, administering only an IgG test, concurrent IgG and PCR testing, and conditional PCR testing if IgG test is positive. So we compared all these options. But the biological markers these tests look at change over time. So to account for this, we stratified our population of healthcare workers into four groups based on their symptom statuses. We have those in early clinical disease, which is further divided into two groups, those who are one to seven days post-symptom onset and those who are eight to 14 days post-symptom onset. We have late clinical disease, so people who are more than 14 days post-symptom onset. And then we have asymptomatic healthcare workers who may or may not be infected. Here you can see a very simplified version of our model. We start by defining the population and then move on to choosing one of the five options that I just mentioned. For these kinds of um, analyses, it works best when you start with true disease status for many reasons, but that, that's what we began with. Um, with the probability that our healthcare worker is either susceptible to the virus is currently infected and infectious with the virus or has recovered and is not infectious anymore. Please keep in mind that we're not using the term recovered to indicate clinical recovery, but that these individuals don't have any viable transmissible virus remaining. Then each of these arms further branch out into having IgG antibodies or not having them. And then um, these are not known to the healthcare workers themselves or the person conducting the screening. These represent the underlying truth. Finally, given each of these conditions, we get either a positive or negative results um, or a combination of test results if more than one test was done, which brings us to our outputs. Based on the test results that a healthcare worker receives, they undergo some sort of behavior change because knowing something changes how you act. Um, they either isolate if they're infected, they keep taking standard precautions, which means preferably working with non-COVID-19 patients at work and social distancing in communities, or they are what we call um, cohort preferred for COVID-19, meaning they are preferentially assigned to COVID-19 units at hospitals, and they're possibly less rigorous about social distancing at home thinking they're immune. And then depending on what behavior they undertook and their underlying disease status, the model finally calculates the number of new infections caused um, both in the healthcare facility and in the community, turns that into an estimate of quality adjusted life years or qualities lost, and finally the total cost of screening and treating the subsequent infections. Just to briefly talk about qualities per COVID-19 infection, we calculated this by using 5.5 um, qualities lost at death and a 0.5% infection fatality rate to account for mortality and we use an estimated 0.05 qualities lost due to long-term morbidity. Next, please. So moving on to our results, um, just an example from the early clinical disease stage, healthcare workers who have been having symptoms for the past seven days, um, and no test and PCR screening. Um, here we have the health outcomes at the top and cost, cost outcomes at the bottom. With no screening, each healthcare worker causes another approximately two new infections, which leads to um, 0.14 qualities lost and $6,000 in treatment costs are incurred due to these infections, but no implementation costs arise because we're not screening anybody. On the other hand, if a PCR test um, screening were to be conducted, there would only be about 0.4 additional infections, so about 0.03 qualities lost, and therefore the treatment costs would be much lower, about $1,300. But of course, we would then have some additional costs of conducting that test. 
So if we look at the results table for screening healthcare worker in this stage, early clinical disease one to seven days post symptom onset, we see that PCR testing is the best way to screen them. It leads to the fewest new infections and the fewest qualities lost, and it also costs the least, making it the dominant strategy. All other options are dominated by PCR testing. So screening healthcare workers eight to 14 days post-symptom onset and asymptomatic healthcare workers gave very similar results to this. So let's quickly take a look at asymptomatics. For asymptomatic healthcare workers, you can see that the qualities at stake are much lower compared to those in early clinical disease, but the outcome is the same and PCR testing dominates. We did multivariate sensitivity analyses on this, which showed that this outcome always remained true no matter how we varied our input variables. Next, please. But things started to change a lot when we were screening healthcare workers in late clinical disease. So those people who started having symptoms more than 15 days ago. In this case, PCR testing was no longer dominant. In fact, it was even worse than doing nothing at all. This is because positive PCR test results are interpreted as false positives at this point and do not indicate isolation because studies suggest that it's highly unlikely for someone to still have viable virus two weeks after infection. So when a truly susceptible individual receives a recovered, quote unquote, recovered status, when they get a false positive PCR test result, they end up taking more risks. But with no testing, everyone acts as if they're susceptible and are more, more cautious. Assuming that full immunity is conferred, only IgG testing is the dominant option for screening people in late clinical disease. Let's take a look at the sensitivity analyses for screening in the late clinical stage, where because these were the most significant. Um, so it turns out that IgG testing is not always dominant. Um, this is the outcome of a Monte Carlo simulation with 10,000 iterations, and it shows that um, conducting no test leads to more quality saved than conducting an IgG test in over 70% of our iterations, indicating that it's dominant in these cases. And next is a tornado graph showing the effect of key inputs on quality saved with no testing. This outcome variable is, was most sensitive to immunity conferral and prevalence, um, which caused the most variation in quality saved. So let's take a closer look at immunity. Looking at the effect immunity has on quality saved with no test compared to IgG testing, we get a perfectly linear relationship. And if, as you can see from the intercept here, around, at around 70% immunity, at around 70% immunity, which means that if you have recovered, you have a 70% reduction in the risk of reinfection if you're exposed. At this point, no, no testing starts to become more beneficial or less harmful than IgG testing. It's important to note that while true immunity conferral may be less than this, the healthcare workers in our model still operate under the assumption that they are immune. And this discrepancy between our understanding of immunity and the true characteristics of it is what causes the poor out health outcomes we see here. So to quickly wrap up, um, we found that PCR testing is the best option when screening healthcare workers who are asymptomatic or recently symptomatic. Adding an antibody test to this or especially conducting only an antibody test generates false reassurances of recovery and immunity, leading to these healthcare workers taking more risks and increasing transmission. Um, many serological studies have also found that the detection rate of antibody tests really increase around the third week after symptom onset. And our findings agree with this in that we find IgG testing to be potentially an effective approach only in the later stages of disease. But while antibody testing is crucial for epidemiologic studies, using them for policy decisions may have unintended harmful effects until we have a greater understanding of COVID-19 immunity. So looking forward, as the research grows, um, we, want to, um, we will update our inputs um, and assumptions and review them um, to have a better representation of the truth. And if and when new testing methods become available, we will incorporate them into the model so we have realistic comparisons. And finally, we would like to adapt this analysis to different settings, especially to new COVID-19 hotspots experiencing resource deficits to achieve the best use of resources in these settings. And with that, I will hand it over to Buntas, who will talk about the general workforce.
Uh, hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, let me just... All right, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into the second part of our analysis, which is uh, slightly broader in scope and focuses on the cost effectiveness of COVID-19 screening in the workplace. So as states across the country have moved to revoke shelter in place policies and reopen their economies, many industries are seeking safe and effective strategies to return to work, especially those that cannot sustain remote work for an extended period of time. And while the United States CDC and OSHA both call for the implementation of health screenings in the workplace, neither specifies the optimal screening modality to be used or the extent to which screening should be incorporated in the workplace. So there's minimal government guidance over this topic. So we sought to answer the question, what are the optimal COVID-19 screening strategies um, to detect COVID-19 in the workplace? So to answer this question, we modeled the ability of different screening methods to detect COVID-19 and their cost of implementation. So let's take a look at the screening methods that we considered. First, we looked at daily self-reported symptom questionnaires, which are intended to detect COVID-19 symptoms. This type of screening is cheap to implement. The price for screening software ranges from zero to $200 and employees can use their own smartphones, tablets, or computers to fill out the screen. However, the strategy is limited in that there is no standard questionnaire, and questionnaires can vary widely in content. At the very least, most questionnaires do ask about the presence of fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And finally, the estimated test performance of this tool is potentially limited by the self-reported nature of the answers. Next, we considered fever screening with non-contact infrared thermometers, which during times of infectious disease outbreaks are deemed safer than normal thermometers because they limit exposures that can occur um, from physical contact with the thermometer. These thermometers have a fairly large price range. They range, range from 50 to $700, with price usually increasing as precision increases. And these thermometers have also been shown to have quite large variations in sensitivities and specificities. So false positives and false negatives can occur. We also consider daily fever screening with infrared thermal image scanners, which are advantageous because they allow for minimal contact between a health professional and a subject, and because they have a relatively high sensitivity and specificity. However, the cost of infrared thermal image scanners is potentially limiting, as this tool uh, can cost between $3,000 and $8,000. The final uh, screening option we considered is weekly infection screening with PCR tests of samples obtained from nasopharyngeal swabs. PCR tests have a relatively high sensitivity and specificity, though test performance is limited by the quality of the sample obtained and by the time frame within which the test is conducted. Another potentially limiting factor of PCR screening is the high cost. In California, each test can cost between $100 and $800 due to the high rent rates of testing sites. So taking all of this together, we can see that COVID-19 screening interventions have varying prices per screen. So this depends on uh, first, the purchasing price of the tool, and second, the need for a human resource to operate the tool. And these interventions also have varying test performances for the symptoms that they are intended to measure. And I'd like to specify here that the test performances listed here pertain to what is measured by the tool, rather than the presence of COVID-19, with PCR screening being the one exception. So we investigated the utility of these screening tools in the following study setting. OSHA defines four risk levels for COVID-19 exposure. Most American workers fall into the lower risk or medium risk categories, so that is where our analysis focuses on. And these work environments include office spaces, manufacturing and industrial facility environments, and some retail environments. Next, our analysis assumes that the work environment in question has standard COVID-19 precautions in place, in particular, personal protective equipment and six feet social distancing, 
which have been shown to be effective in reducing the transmission of COVID-19. Um, due to the large heterogeneity and what a workplace could look like, for the purpose of this presentation, I will be focusing on a case study of a mid-sized company with 100 employees whose work is office-based. So in our theoretical company of 100 individuals, we modeled three possible infection states among the employees, which mirrored the infection states of the general population in California. We then incorporated a prevalence estimate for each infection state, and the estimates we used in this, in this analysis are guided by a very limited number of reports available for California. So in particular, two studies of antibody seroprevalence from Santa Clara County and Los Angeles County, um, both of which were published in April, were incorporated into our analysis. The next step was to model the prevalence of COVID-19 symptoms among each infection state. Again, these data, in, these data points have varying degrees of uncertainty in them. Literature reviews were conducted to obtain estimates of symptom prevalence, but in situations in which there was little to no available data, um, expert opinion was sought from clinicians. And what we found here is that the high prevalence of asymptomatic carriers is what ultimately compromises the ability of symptom-based screening tools in particular to detect COVID-19 cases. Furthermore, COVID-19 symptoms are not limited to COVID-19 cases. They're indistinguishable from other respiratory illnesses and can occur across each infection state. Some key assumptions of our model is that individuals flagged by a screening method as being a suspected COVID-19 case are instructed to isolate from the workplace and follow up with a PCR test. So in each screening scenario, return to work is contingent on a negative PCR result. We also assume that isolation from the workplace results in a 50% loss of productivity. And we conducted sensitivity analyses on this data point as well as other uncertain data, point, data inputs in our analysis. This slide here contains a general summary of the outcomes we estimated. So first, we looked at the ability of screening methods to accurately detect COVID-19 cases. And there are two parts to this. Um, first, we looked at positive predictive value. So how many individuals flagged as a suspected COVID-19 case are true COVID-19 infections? Next, we looked at the false negative rate. So how many true COVID-19 cases go undetected? We also modeled behavior changes uh, based on COVID-19 screening or test results. So employees either isolated or continued working depending on their screening result. However, we recognize that the rigidity of isolation can vary depending on how certain you are that you have COVID. So we also modeled the certainty psychology associated with each screening method. For example, while a PCR test confirms your infection status, positive fever screen doesn't necessarily indicate that you have COVID. Finally, we looked at the cost and health outcomes for each screening method. So for health outcomes, we looked at infections transmitted in the workplace and community and the associated qualities lost. And for cost outcomes, we looked at testing, uh, the cost of lost productivity resulting from isolating from the workplace, whether it's working remotely or because of illness. And finally, the cost of treating new COVID-19 infections. So let's take a look at our results now. Based on the ability of each screening tool to accurately detect and isolate COVID-19 cases, we estimated the number of new infections and qualities lost in each scenario. So as you can see, PCR screening resulted in the lowest number of new infections and qualities lost in our company of 100 individuals. And this represents the number of infections transmitted in the workplace, in the community, and the resulting indirect infections resulting from both workplace and community infections. And while this result reflects the ability of PCR screening to accurately detect and isolate COVID-19 cases, it also demonstrates the limited capacity of our most accurate screening method as a moderate number of infections are still permitted. Next, we looked at the positive predictive value for each screening method with PCR screening having the highest value. This is advantageous for companies because in, this, in PCR screening, Fewer falsely suspected cases are instructed to work remotely, so there's a lower associated reduction in overall company productivity. You can see here that infrared thermal image scanners have low positive predictive values, 
which means that among individuals flagged by this tool as being a suspected case, a small number are actually infected. So in essence, in this scenario, there's a larger number of employees being asked to isolate from the workplace who don't have COVID compared to other screening scenarios. The high positive predictive value of PCR screening largely drives our cost results. Here's a summary of the costs associated with each screening strategy. Uh, we first calculated the per day cost of implementing each screening tool, which is, takes into account the purchasing price of the screening tool, um, the need for a human resource to operate the screening tool, as well as the cost of procuring additional PCR tests for um, suspected cases. Next, we looked at the per day cost of isolating suspected COVID-19 cases, which results in lost productivity for the company. And finally, the cost of treating new COVID-19 infections that are generated in each screening scenario. As you can see in the first column, PCR screening and infrared thermal image scanners are expensive to implement, owing to the high cost of procuring tests and thermal image scanners, plus the need for a human resource to operate these tools. Um, infrared thermal image scanners are further compromised by the high associated cost of isolating um, suspected COVID-19 cases in this scenario, which owes to the poor specificity of thermal image scanners. So ultimately, PCR screening is the second cheapest option, which owes to the low associated cost of isolating cases and treating new infections. And total cost here is partly driven by the cost of treating new COVID-19 infections. And these are costs that may not be considered by, the, um, by employers um, when deciding which screening method to implement because these costs would likely be covered by insurance. However, even if you take out the cost of COVID-19 treatment, PCR screening remains the second cheapest option to implement for an employer. To determine the cost effectiveness of the screening options, we constructed in incremental cost effectiveness ratios. So when considering the overall cost and health outcomes of each screening intervention, PCR screening was found to be cost effective compared to no screening and dominant compared to the other three screening methods. It results in the second lowest net cost and the lowest number of new infections and qualities lost. After determining the cost effectiveness of PCR screening compared to other screening methods, we uh, wanted to look further into the feasibility of implementing screening in the workplace in scenarios involving varying losses of productivity from shutting down the workplace. So in particular, we asked at what point does the cost of shutting down a company outweigh the cost of lost productivity? And what we found is that in scenarios where very little productivity is lost from shutting down the workplace, it ends up being more expensive to implement screening in the workplace. However, in scenarios in which more productivity is lost from shutting down the workplace, it, becomes, it then becomes more expensive to shut down. So it's in these scenarios in particular which can benefit from implementing PCR screening. So I'll finish with um, some just implications. Uh, we found that weekly PCR screening is a cost-effective option for screening employees although it still permits a moderate number of infections, and symptom screening is insufficient to prevent the widespread transmission of COVID-19 um, in the workplace, owing to the high prevalence of asymptomatic carriers. So with that, um, I will open up the floor for questions. Thank you so much for a great uh, presentation. Uh, Colin Boyle will be kindly moderating the Q&A questions uh, from the audience. Uh, everyone participating here, please uh, pose your questions in the Q&A icon. Uh, I can see already a number uh, coming. So Colin, would you kindly take the floor? Sure. Thank you both for uh, thank you for this uh, those wonderful presentations. Great work. I think it's uh, fantastic to see the uh, the rigor of the analysis and the thoughtfulness that go into the modeling exercises you've done. So so uh, kudos to to both of you. Um, I I had um, uh, a couple of questions on on methodological issues first before uh, turning to some of the policy issues. Um, there was one about you know polys versus dailies. I'm just wondering if uh, uh, that's because we're, we're operating primarily in this analysis in a US context and whether there would be any material differences if you thought about uh, 
uh, the metric being uh, dailies rather than qualies? Yeah, so from what I've seen in the literature, most of the time cost effectiveness analyses do use qualies instead of dollies. I personally just find it more intuitive to think about the benefits, cost per benefits gained rather than cost per um, harms avoided, um, if that makes sense. Um, and it's also partially a data accessibility issue because quality estimates were available um, from Avalon Health Economics. So that's what we based our estimates on. Great. Can, can I just chime in and say that um, dallies and qualies are really uh, magnitudes the same. They're just in the opposite direction. And I will shamelessly advertise the video, the Dally Show, which is in YouTube and um, by yours truly. And if you want to learn more, go to the Dally Show for nine minutes of fun entertainment about dallies. Great. So then, uh, uh, building on, on the, the quality daily uh, question, um, this is a new disease, uh, six months old, uh, maybe seven now. We're learning about it. Uh, we don't have clear insight into what the long-term uh, morbid morbidity consequences are going to be from this. And so I'm wondering how you came up with the proxy for the quality you used. In, in, is there another disease that used as a proxy or, or some other way of estimating what the COVID number would be? Yeah, that's a great question. So for so we separated into the mortality and morbidity aspects because we had estimates available for the mortality part of it, um, provided by, as I just mentioned, Avalon Health Economics, and they um, based it off of CDC life tables for the US and accounted for existing comorbidities in the population too. That, so I think that's a fairly good estimate. Um, but for the morbidity part, at first we didn't really incorporate that, to be honest, because we didn't really know about the long-term effects um, of COVID-19, the long-term consequences. But as we were doing the study, their evidence started piling up about all these long-term um, neurologic problems, GI problems, all these other stuff that we didn't really see early on. So we added sort of a estimate of 0.05 to account for that at the end. But I don't know if Jen wants to speak to that a little more. Well, we, we felt like we had to include something because of the developing evidence of serious long-term uh, consequences. And we, we kind of thought about how sick people get when they just have a, you know, a, a case without long-term consequences and then some of these really long-term consequences. And at that point, we guessed. We knew we better off guessing imprecisely than omitting it entirely. So uh, we're going to try something a little different here. Um, so uh, George Rutherford, who uh, has a couple of questions that I know isn't around, uh, may not be around for the full session. Uh, we're going to try to add him. Oh, there he is. Hi, George. Welcome. Uh, Aloha. Over to you, George. You got a couple of questions. So yeah, <clears throat> for both of you, this is really strong, guys. This is really great. Um, so there's some basic issues that run through here, uh, largely, de largely dealing with immunity, which is to say we don't know what that means. Um, the, uh, so for Siegel, um, how, when you talk about people staffing, when you talk about staffing healthcare with people who are, who are seropositive, mm -hmm. you have any idea how many, so, you know, talking about, you know, sort of reality here on the West coast. So Stanford screened all their healthcare workers and found exactly 0.3% positive. Uh, all of whom were from food service and, and gardening. Um, so it strikes me that, you know, this idea that uh, as a, in a, at a practical point, being able to sort out for people who are immune and can take care of patients uh, is not particularly a doable thing. Now, we did this with Ebola in West Africa, where we're basically using, you know, training survivors as, as um, kind of medical assistants to help with kind of care at the bedside. But um, it's going to be, uh, I, I think that's going to be a, a, a tough one to, to pull off. So, you know, I, and I, the other thing about immunity, there's some new papers that just came out today and yesterday, not that you're supposed to know that, uh, that really um, show that even neutralizing antibody directed against the uh, receptor binding domain wanes quite quickly, like over 90 days. Um, and you may be IgG positive after that, but what exactly does it mean in terms of actually being protected? Having said all that, we've yet to find a case of reinfection, so it may be. But maybe you could maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And then 
Guntis, let me just get this one in for, for you. Those two studies you cited about Santa Clara and Los Angeles are easily the two worst studies that have ever been done um, and are, 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 are in everybody's books about how not to do studies. I mean, that's sort of an exaggeration. Um, but it, it's, you know, the real antibody positivity rate in those studies is 1%. And, the, the, and all the kind of machinations to make it 5% were just that, machinations. Mm -hmm. So I you kind of want to, you know, so just to say that part, but just so you're, just so we're clear. Um, <laughs> the other uh, thing is, how did you build in masks and social distancing in the workplace? Uh, is there a baseline assumption that everybody does that? Or is that an add-on here that gives you additional, an additional bump? Uh, or kind of how does that fit into it all? So I will, I'll beam off now unless you have questions for me. No. Um, so I can talk a little bit about immunity. So the problem arises because we don't necessarily know what's going on. If we assume that immunity is conferred, then all is good. Then immune healthcare workers can safely treat COVID-19 patients, but we don't really know. And because of that, when we assume that we do confer immunity, but in truth we don't, then that's when the problem arises. Um, so if we have more knowledge, then I feel like it would be completely fine to suggest that as a policy, but until we know, I, I personally would be a little bit weary of saying, yes, do this, because we don't really know what's going on. Jen, it's not like you're not gonna use PPE. Well, you would, but the issue is if you know that you're immune, then you would be less strict and less careful outside of the hospital. It's just... Okay. <laughs> Don't try this at all for the studio <laughs> audience. Yeah. Um, I can jump in now. So thank you so much, Dr. Rutherford, for pointing out um, the critiques of those studies. That's exactly why I mentioned those studies. Um, I almost had a stroke when you did it, by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that is why I mentioned it's the Santa Clara study. It's the Los Angeles study. I think there's studies that are widely known because they had some high estimates um, given out. And we did conduct sensitivity analyses to account for quite large uncertainties in that. And um, in sensitivity analyses, when you, uh, when you bring down the prevalence of COVID, your number of infections does go down, but the ordering of our options remains the same. So we definitely do need to update our numbers with longitudinal studies. Um, and in terms of incorporating masks and social distancing in the workplace, so we assume that Every individual wears a mask um, and social distances to the best of their ability. Obviously, as humans, we are imperfect. So we looked at some systematic reviews that uh, look at the effectiveness of those measures in um, the transmission of infectious diseases, and then incorporated the effectiveness of these practices into the reproductive number of, um, of COVID-19. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thank you, George. Thank you for those questions. Um, uh, uh, just to uh, uh, respond to a few other questions that uh, people have posed. One is around frequency of testing. Uh, there are uh, some reports of White House personnel uh, taking tests daily and even some suggestions in the uh, press earlier today that the president is taking tests more frequently than once a day in some cases. Any, any thoughts on uh, what's the optimal frequency in the different contexts that you guys have looked at? Absolutely, I can um, jump in. Um, I think we wanted to root our analysis in a pragmatic approach and um, especially in our conversations with um, clinicians and with the emergency director uh, that we were speaking with, um, it was evident that PCR testing is in short stock and um, it's not available all the time and you you know the number of resources in that realm are limited and so i think if we were to test every day that would obviously be ideal we want to track infections as quickly as we can um, that would drive up costs but i think it would also drive down the number of infections that are permitted in a pcr screening scenario um, in my analysis, we looked at weekly screening because that was deemed the most feasible option given resource constraints. So if PCR testing um, was made cheaper and more available, then more frequent testing would definitely be recommended. Sigal, any, any comments from you on that? Any difference in that? 
Yeah, we didn't really talk about, so my results were per screen, um, not based on a weekly or daily testing routine. Um, but because it is per screen, obviously, the more frequently you do that test, the more infections do you avoid. Um, so yes, it would drive um, implementation costs up, but it would also drive the medical costs down and generate less, fewer new infections. So yes, that would be um, ideal, but that's not really applicable everywhere. Okay. Um, that uh, leads into one other uh, question that's come up, which is you know, your analyses really have been helpful in prioritizing within a set of options that we have now, a set of choices, given certain parameters around uh, cost and efficacy and, and the like. Uh, and that's great for the choices we have, but uh, it could also inform to a certain extent product development. Uh, and so as you think about um, not what we have now, but what you wish you might have in terms of the future choices, what parameters might you emphasize if you had the chance to improve cost, efficacy, access and scalability, um, you know, what, what should the guidance here be for not employers sending people back to work, but for product development? Sure, I can um, speak a little bit on that. In my opinion, I think, at least in, in what I saw in my analysis was, um, infections are generated because you have um, COVID-19 cases thinking that they're not infected. They either have a false negative screening result um, or they have no screening result in general. And so they continue to interact with people in the workplace, which even with personal protective equipment and social distancing um, can still generate um, infection. So even PCR screening is limited in test performance. We see that um, the time frame in which you conduct the test and the quality of the sample obtained limits the test performance. So what I would first say is improving test performance could really limit the number of false negatives that we see and drive down infections. Um, second, I think uh, it would be interesting to see, um, I know someone had mentioned to me the idea of self-swabbing and, and kind of not incorporating human resources such as registered nurses or other health professionals to be operating these tools. So to make these um, more accessible to a general lay person to be able to uh, track infection in their own body or to track symptoms without the the use of a health professional i think could also improve these screening methods yeah i agree with everything good test just said i just want to add that um, there is this issue with pcr testing that you're not necessarily detecting virus that is transmissible um, so that actually because you're isolating potentially more people than you need to. That's also at a cost to society and lost productivity, um, the, the time these people take off work. And especially in my analysis, um, it drives some, t in cases it may drive a lot of healthcare workers to unnecessarily be isolated. So it decreases the healthcare workforce, which we really don't wanna have at this point. Um, so I think improving that, improving the um, accuracy of PCR testing and also if this was at all possible, finding a way to um, detect active viable virus rather than viral fragments at a sort of point of care scenario, rather than waiting for viral culture to grow, that would be ideal. Okay, so kind of a good guidance on, on the product development and product enhancement side. Um, what one of the questions from the audience actually uh, deals with kind of the PCR test and, and lab costs, one of the challenges we've seen is scarcity of uh, lab capacity to process tests, very long delays, unless you're in the NBA in Orlando or wherever they've set up special contracts. And I'm wondering how you calculated uh, that in your analysis. Uh, was the lab cost included as part of the total cost of the test or, um, uh, and did you factor time in? Or what is yeah. something to make about time? That's a great question. So in the healthcare worker part, um, we assume that the test would be conducted in-house so that no training would be necessary. All the equipment would already be there and everybody would know how to use them. So we didn't really um, incorporate those costs, but we did because it can really differ if you do this, if you outsource this, um, we changed the, we looked at the effect of changing those costs in our sensitivity analyses and it didn't really make much of a difference in the conclusion. Okay, great. Yeah, similar in my analysis um, and for the workplace testing, we did assume that the tests would be outsourced 
um, and we took into account the high cost of rent for testing sites and of health personnel. Um, didn't look at the, the lab cost and, um, and kind of the effect of a very long turnaround time, though our analysis, does, our analysis assumes that you can't return to work until you have a negative result. Um, but that would definitely be interesting to take into account. But we did vary our prices a lot to acknowledge the, um, the variation in there. Um, good, just one, one uh, question for you on, on your analysis of PCR. <laughs> you mentioned um, that um, workplaces with higher productivity losses from working from home uh, would be better off using the test than those that had a lower productivity loss. I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm on the slide, I think was sort of 10%. Was that the actual break even on the baseline analysis you did? Or was there a specific number that served as the break even on that? Yeah, it's a general break even. We looked at um, a threshold of about four infections per month and said that after uh, four infections have occurred um, and have been confirmed to occur in the workplace, the company um, would deem that as the beginning of an outbreak within the workplace and shut down. And so um, at that point, so we basically compared uh, like the positive predictive values of all the different um, screening options to look at the cost of lost productivity associated with each, each screening intervention and compared those costs with the cost of completely shutting down the workplace. And we found that when you don't lose much productivity and shutting down the workplace, um, it's more expensive to implement screening and you can, you can sustain remote work for a longer period of time. Um, but we're cognizant that that's not every work environment. And so um, if you do lose a lot of productivity and um, a lot of money in, in shutting down your workplace, then PCR screening is a cost effective option. And if you can sustain more frequent PCR screening, then you should do that. Great. One of the challenges of applying um, cost effectiveness in the healthcare space is just that the costs are incurred by some people, the benefits are enjoyed by other people. And here we have a situation where we're talking about productivity, you know, which accrues to the employer, health losses to the employee, mm -hmm. and sometimes the out-of-pocket or the cost, pay the cash payments coming from insurers, the other third party. And yeah. I'm wondering, um, are, do you have any thoughts based on this analysis on how to clean that up in some way so that uh, the right decisions can be taken for everyone as a whole, as a, which is what your analysis shows? Yeah, so, you know, the goal of our analysis was to lay out, you know, the number of new infections uh, created in each screening scenario, the associated costs, and the associated costs of treating new COVID-19 infections. And we split the costs into the perspective of an employer and the perspective of society. And we hope that with everything laid out, um, people will care about the health losses and the, you know, the number of infections that are generated in each screening scenario. And we have that information available. Um, but we wanted to be cognizant that, um, you know, it, it might just be about costs in some scenarios, or you might want to have, you know, full knowledge of, of the costs that are being associated. And so we included that information as well. And I see Jim wanting to speak. Yeah, Jim, come on in. You're, you're muted. No, absolutely. What, what Gunta said, but I, I, it also occurs to me that this choice, this trade-off between the, the productivity and the company's situation and the health effects and the medical costs um, uh, uh, it's a microcosm of the broader debate we're having in our country and that we haven't handled very well, uh, which is the trade-off between pandemic control and economic, economic robustness. Um, and, and so um, I think it's, it's probably worth a, a, another look at, at, at how that trade-off plays out and whether it in fact, it, you know, echoes to some extent the broader debate. Thank you, Jim. Um, uh, the, the analysis you guys did were of healthcare uh, settings and uh, offices, you know, companies. Uh, the, the other uh, debate we're all having as a society right now is about schools. Uh, you know, I think uh, that's coming up very quickly and uh, not just at the higher ed level where universities are opening and then reclosing and then reopening and then reclosing by the day, it seems, uh, but also elementary schools, middle schools. I, I know you didn't analyze how, you, how this works at the school level, 
but I'm wondering if you'd be willing to conjecture what um, insights from your analyses here might port over to a school decision and what might be different? Sure. Um, yeah, we considered looking at schools um, and to be honest, we settled on looking at the workplace because it's a simpler analysis to conduct. Um, schools is, it's difficult to address. Um, very recently, there was a cost effectiveness analysis um, published by researchers at Yale University, which looks at um, the cost effectiveness of COVID-19 screening strategies in guiding the reopening of college campuses. And um, the results of my analysis are in line with theirs. And they uh, looked at um, the cost effectiveness of PCR screening, and they found that, I have it pulled up, rapid, inexpensive, and frequently conducted screening, even if only 70% sensitive, would be cost effective and produce a modest number of COVID-19 infections um, on college campuses. So I think if, if you have access to um, sufficient resources to, to screen your students, if it's inexpensive, and if you can conduct these tests rapidly, that is an option to guide the reopening of college campuses. Um, whether or not that's possible to implement, um, you know, rapid screening, inexpensive screening, that's another question. So those are my comments on that question. Thank you. Sigal, anything to add? Yeah, no, not really. I think it's also important to recognize that the um, outcomes of this disease or the consequences in um, ch younger children are different than what we see in adults. So I think that's also important to incorporate into the um, and that would be changing the treatment costs, that would be changing the long-term effects. The long-term effects would be longer because they're incurred earlier in life. So yeah, I think it's important to look into that. I'll just add uh, very quickly that um, uh, uh, my colleague Natasha Martin at UC San Diego, who is a, a modeler and cost-effectiveness analyst as well, is looking at school closures uh, extensively and she is uh, part of our new uh, University of California COVID Modeling Consortium. That's an advertisement. It, uh, <clears throat> send your analysis questions our way. And, and uh, do you have a pithy uh, acronym or expression to capture the name of that consortium like you've done for GeekCon? <clears throat> we know uh, no one's listening to me anymore, Colin, so. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, Jaime, you were going to come in. No, I, I was, uh, Wondering if um, availability of uh, PCR tests and availability of laboratories to do the testing is something that needs to be uh, considered in the in the costing. Um, the more expanded from workforce to schools to other uh, environments, uh, the more complex this situation might get. How do you incorporate that into the costing model? Uh, basically, we looked at, so in my analysis in particular, I, I focused on the cost of um, PCR screening um, in California and found that it can range from 100 to $800 per test. And that takes into account um, the cost of the test itself the cost of the human resource to operate the test and uh, the rent associated with a testing site. So we did not incorporate um, scarcity of, of labs to, um, to, uh, to screen the tests. Um, and I think that's definitely something we would want to incorporate in the future and acknowledge exactly as you said that kind of the broader scale you go, uh, you know, the the more scarce these uh, testing facilities would become. And we would definitely want to look at that. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's a really important next step to incorporate that because both our results really highlight the need to scale up PCR testing and the capacity to run those tests. Um, so incorporating those costs of scale up would be important as a next step. Okay. Um, well, we're getting towards the end of the session. I wonder, Colin, if we have uh, one last uh, burning question to um, what, One quick one that just came in, which is really about some of the uh, point of care machines, the Abbott test and uh, others. I'm just wondering if 
you, you, I know you started this analysis a few months back and some of these things have been coming on relatively quickly. Uh, do you have any thoughts on some of the newer tests that you, you wish you might have been able to include in your analysis? Um, any, any thoughts on their performance? Yeah, for, for me, I definitely would like to incorporate um, the self-administered PCR test because they take a lot of the human resource costs out of the question, but you also lose a lot of the accuracy, I think, with that because can you really push a swab that far down your nose on your own? Um, so the effectiveness would be less, I assume. Um, but yes, definitely something that's more accessible, that's more point of care, especially when we come to applying these analyses to um, lower income regions where, where resources are lower. Um, so I think those are really important to add on in the future. And is there any evidence of a trainer, trainee, uh, operator kind of testing quality impacting results? Like if you're, have people studied, uh, you know, some nurses get more false positives or false nerve negatives when they do the swabs. I imagine there's some variance in operator performance, but is there, is it a big part of the issue or only a small variation? Have you seen anything on that? Um, I'm not sure the extent to which it affects test performance, but I know it does. I know it, it you know, the quality of the sample obtained affects um, the test performance. So I have seen um, studies looking at uh, like uh, different trainings of health professionals. I can't comment right now on the extent to which that affects test performance, um, but I know it does to some degree. Agreed. Fantastic. Uh, well, I think this has been a wonderful session. Thank you uh, to our panelists. Thank you for our, to our moderator. I have one last question for Gunther and Siegel. Um, what are you planning to do with this uh, wonderful research? Uh, are you planning to publish? And uh, if so, where would you like to see your paper published? <laughs> Yeah, we are planning um, on publishing this. We're actually working on our manuscripts, but before that, these analyses will be our capstone projects this week. Um, so that's the first step. And then we're um, already working on our manuscripts. We're looking forward to submitting them to journals. And um, to be honest, we're aiming pretty high. <laughs> Good. Fantastic. Well, congratulations for an excellent uh, work. Um, just a reminder to audio, our audience that uh, this session has been recorded and is available in, in YouTube. Uh, Robert Mansfield has the link and we'll post the link in our website. So you can uh, go back to the slides and review the wonderful presentations in uh, a little more detail if you wish to do so. Um, finally, just a quick reminder the next uh, session will also be uh, presented by a group of uh, fabulous uh, student panelists and we will be focusing on uh, a comparison of different uh, states and counties within the US. Uh, what strategies have adopted, what works, what doesn't, and the impact of those uh, policies. Uh, that will take place on August uh, 4th. So uh, for the summer, we will be doing this COVID-19 series every two weeks. In the fall, most likely we will come back to a weekly uh, periodicity. But for the time being, for August, we will be doing this uh, bi-weekly. So please join us. Um, on August the 4th with a fascinating topic again. I want to thank uh, Siegel and Guspa for, and Jane for a really splendid presentation. Thank you, Colin, and uh, see you in a couple of weeks. Goodbye and thank, thank you. you. Thank you.